In the previous video, I explained why it is important to understand the historical background of Judaism and provided you with some important chronological milestones. In this video review, I focus mainly on the spread of Christianity and how the map of Christianity has changed over 2000 years. So bear with me, in the next few minutes I'll take you into a very interesting journey and you'll see how the center of Christianity has been shifting from one part of the world to another. I'll be using maps and graphs, so it must be fairly easy for you to grasp the holistic picture. Christianity started in the Middle East, about 2000 years ago, and later became the most popular and globally dispersed religion on the planet. According to Professor Douglas Jacobson, at this present time, we are living through the most significant transformation in the history of Christianity, bigger than the conversion of Constantine, bigger than the split between Catholicism and Orthodoxy, even bigger than the Reformation. Jacobson claims this most significant period of transition and change has to do with where Christians live. By the way, in this review I'll heavily rely on the work of Dr. Jacobson and his lectures. I will even rely on many of his lecture slides, so full credit goes to Dr. Jacobson and his wonderful book that is well organized, full of useful graphs and data and written in a very plain language. In the 18th century, about 85% of Christians lived in Europe. Only about 1% lived in Africa, 3 in Asia, 3 in North America and 8 in South America. In 1900s, still most of the world's Christians lived in Europe, almost 70%. Today, however, Christians are spread almost evenly around the world. 25% in Europe, 25% in Africa, 25% in South America, 10% in North America and 15% in Asia. So the Christian world has become more diverse than it's ever been before. While in the mind of many there is a picture of a unified church that later was divided into many branches, Christianity was never unified. It consisted of many versions or interpretations that were based on different traditions and doctrines. At the same time, these different versions of Christianity went through its evolution and transformation. For example, if we take the most widespread form of Christianity, Roman Catholic, it would differ depending on time and space. Roman Catholicism of the 5th century is different from the Roman Catholicism in the 21st century. Similarly, Catholics in modern Edinburgh, Scotland would be different from most Catholics in rural area of Bolivia. So please keep this in mind. When we say Christianity, it may mean very different things for different people. But as I've just mentioned, these days Christianity is going through one of the most dramatic periods of change in its history, and this change has to do with the globalization of Christianity. This transformation has to do not with splits or doctrinal changes, but with where Christians live. In other words, the face of Christianity is drastically changing. Due to various processes, political, economic, migration, wars, colonization, etc., the center of Christian influence has been shifting. From the very beginning of the movement, it spread very quickly in the Roman and Persian empires. In the first 500 years, it probably even reached the borders of India, and also spread to Armenia, Georgia, Ethiopia, Arabia, and all the way northward into Ireland. This is an approximate area where Christians lived by the year 600. Pretty good for just 5-6 centuries, don't you think so? By 650 it had spread even further to China. So by the 650 Christianity had already been quite a global and multicultural religion. But look what happened next. In the 7th century Christianity faced a challenge from a competing religion that like Christianity originated in the Middle East and was similar in many ways. It was Islam. Many people in those years even confused them and did not see a big difference between Islam and Christianity, because lots of teaching of Islam are based on the teaching and ideas of Judaism and Christianity. Therefore, for many, it was just another version of Judaism. But later, the difference became more obvious. In 632, the Prophet Muhammad dies, but before his death, he managed to unify most of the Arab tribes that had previously constantly fought with each other. And soon Islam began to spread relatively quickly in North Africa and the Middle East. By 650, it had already reached Spain. And of course, all this greatly influenced the geography of Christianity, which had to move north. Just take a look. This is what the territory of Muslims looked like by 800. 
And on this territory there was a remnant of the old Roman Empire, which we know as the Byzantine Empire. Here the primary form of Christianity was Chalcedonian Orthodoxy. The Catholic Church or the Church of the West was dominating in Western Europe. Church of the East, also known as Nestorian or Persian Church, was in the Central Asia and all the way to China. And finally, Mathezite churches were spread between the Church of the East and Byzantine Church. Four of the big ones were Armenian, Syrian, Coptic and Ethiopian. Sorry, now I won't go into details of the theological differences between the Chalcedonian version of Christianity and Mathezite or Nestorian, I just want to mention that some of these differences were not so much a matter of faith, but the result of political and economic battles. For example, as Justo Gonzalez explained, because Armenia was being invaded by the Persians and the Roman Empire did not come to help them, representatives of the Armenian Church were not present at the Council of Chalcedon. But most importantly, the Roman Empire lost its trust in the eyes of Armenians and they rejected the decision of Chalcedon. Similarly to Armenians, the Copts of Egypt also rejected the decision of Chalcedon, mainly for political and social reasons. In addition, it affected the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. Mark Knoll admits that politics rather than religion played an important role in decision making. For instance, the iconoclast controversy also demonstrates how secular authorities were able to intervene in the doctrinal issues. Whether icons or religious images will be used and worshipped in a way dependent on politicians and not churchmen. Or it could be the influence of one religious tradition on another. The spread of Islam in the Middle East almost destroyed icon veneration, and today they might not exist in Orthodox churches if the policy of iconoclasm had not been abolished in the Byzantine Empire in the 9th century. Sorry for going off the topic, so Christianity was still quite widespread in Asia. For example, if we divide the world map this way, then around the year 800 more than half of the Christian population would have been on the eastern side of this line. It wasn't the European but global multicultural religion. Things changed starting from the 12th century. Mainly due to the Crusades, Islamic attitude toward Christian had changed and persecution of Christians increased. Western Catholic armies from Western Europe came into the Middle East seeking to reconquer the Holy Land from Islam and reclaim it as Christian territories. They failed and as a result, by the year 1500, the number of Christians in Asia and Northern Africa dropped from about 50% to only about 15%. It was forced out from Asia and Christianity in Europe had come to represent 85% of all the Christians in the world in fact, becoming mainly the religion of the Europeans. Before we move forward, please remember that this is a very brief overview. Obviously, things are not that simple and most changes happen gradually and various reasons are involved. In the 16th century, Islam is expanding. Orthodox Christianity is forced to move north and spread from the Balkans to the territory of Eastern Europe. The Catholics retain the south and west of Europe, but in the north Protestantism is becoming popular. The Mathezite churches continue to exist in the midst of Islam, but their numbers and influence have been greatly reduced. This way just very few Christians left in Asia. But a very important phase in the history of Christianity occurred in the 16th century. It has to do with the global Catholic mission. Europeans were looking for new trade roads, avoiding Muslim lands. Therefore, in many ways the economic motives led to the era of great discoveries and this contributed to the spread of Christianity to other continents. Later, also the Protestant global mission began. Professor Dana Robert in her Christian mission How Christianity Became a World Religion states, in the early 17th century, newly Protestant nations looked beyond Europe to establish trade relations and to plant colonies. Given that the Catholic popes had validated Portuguese and Spanish claims to control the non-European world when England and Holland became Protestant, it freed them from papal control and allowed them to enter the race for overseas colonies. The first Protestant ministers to go abroad were chaplains attached to the various trading companies and military outposts, similar to the way the Catholic priests had accompanied Spanish conquistadors to the Americas. According to Douglas Jacobson, however, before the 1800s Protestant missionaries were not so active, so the major Protestant mission began only after 1800. 
but take a look at the result. Even after hundreds of years of efforts by both Catholic and Protestants, still by the year 1900, more than two-thirds of Christians still lived in Europe. 2% in Africa, only 5 in Asia, 11 in South America and 14 in North America. Jacobson writes, in 1900, two-thirds of the world Christians lived in Europe, and many of the Christians living in North America and Latin America were of European descent. Europeans and their New World descendants thus accounted for more than 90% of all the Christians in the world. Then the demographics of global Christianity began to change, and they changed with almost unbelievable rapidity. Over the last hundred years, Europe's share of the world's Christian population had collapsed from 65% to 25%, and it is still falling. Meanwhile, the number of Christians in Africa, Asia and Latin America has exploded. But how such a rapid change was possible? The answer is Pentecostalism, my friends. Pentecostalism emerges as a new Christian tradition around the year 1900, and right from the very beginning, it is a missionary-oriented movement that begins to spread their new understanding of Christianity all around the globe. Dr. Jacobson calls Pentecostalism a movement with fuzzy boundaries and many different associations and denominations. It emphasizes the gift of the Holy Spirit. He states, Many Pentecostals also affirm the Protestant view of salvation as a once and done event, but that event is constructed as the beginning and not the end of salvation. For Pentecostals, salvation is a lifelong journey into ever deeper fellowship with God. Protestantism centers on the Word, on doctrine and scriptural teachings. Pentecostalism centers on experience, the felt presence of God in person's life. In this review, I won't go into details of the history and origins of the Pentecostal movement, but I'd like to mention that perhaps one of the secrets of success lies in their flexibility. They simply were more flexible and adaptable in comparison with Orthodoxy, Catholicism and Protestantism. In his work The Missionary Movement in Christian History, Andrew Walls talks about the indigenizing versus pilgrim principles. One of the most significant questions indigenous people face when Christian culture comes to their land, with peace or with sword, is how to deal with their own past. How much of their previous religion and culture can they accept and what do they have to condemn? In that sense, Pentecostalism allowed more flexibility, and instead of imposing their Western culture on locals and rejecting the most of pre-Christian cultural elements as false, ugly or evil, Pentecostals adapted under the need and preferences of locals and allowed local leadership and local language to guide the movement. For example, if we divide the world into the Global North and the Global South, then in 1900, 80% of the world Christians lived in the Global North and only 20% lived in the Global South. Today, however, 65% of all the Christians in the world live in the Global South and only 35 live in the Global North. And such change was possible in many ways due to the Pentecostal movement. Today, there are approximately five times as many Pentecostals in the South as there are in the North. Another difference is that the Global South is often described as more conservative, while the Global North is more liberal or progressive. To conclude our brief overview, Christianity began as a diverse multicultural movement, but later it became predominantly European or Western tradition. Today, however, we have Christianity that is globally diverse and dispersed as none other religion in human history. Just for the sake of comparison, these days 99% of Buddhists and 99% of Hindus live in Asia. If we talk about Islam, 70% of Muslims live in Asia, 27% in Africa and only about 3-4% on other continents. But Christians today live all over the world. The center of its gravity, however, keeps changing and who knows, maybe in a couple of centuries the face and the form of Christianity will be very different. My friends, thank you for watching till the end. If you need more information, please check suggested bibliography below. If you appreciate what I do on this channel, please do not hesitate to give me a like, to leave a comment below and please share this video in your circles, it helps me a lot. Thank you and I wish you peace and health wherever you are.